what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell you some personal stories. We're gonna tell you get a, a box of tissues. Get a box. It's really, really sad. Yeah. And then we're gonna tell you guys kind of what the antidote to that is. Like, how right. do you make a margarita out of your saltiness? <laughs> Cheers. Cheers! Welcome to Creative Happy Hour. Yay! Where we get drunk on the creative possibilities. Yes, we do. Every week. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome to this week's episode where we are drinking... We are drinking the margarita. Yes, we are. Because we wanted to talk about what happens when you get a little salty. Yes. <laughs> with your creative practice. Mm -hmm. Why that happens and what to do about it. Yes. So, there you go. It's going to be a fun episode. We're going to talk about a lot of things. We are. So... Let's well, taste let's this margarita taste this salty and little... see exactly. Let's see how this is. Mm. I love margaritas. They're mm. like a vacation in a glass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's, it's just, just like, like when you need to get away from it all. It's yeah. Like, this is what you crave. Tequila, take me away. Right? Right. I mean, I think it's so interesting. So the history of this drink, everybody wants to claim it because it's such a great drink. It is. It is. It's, you know? it's one of the best. Mm. Cocktails. Like, what makes it so popular? I mean, well, what makes it so popular is all of the flavors. So the mm -hmm. salt, the salt on the rim My is very part. traditional, <laughs> and that cuts the bitterness mm -hmm. of the lime and the tequila. Mm -hmm. So good, and, and then, then the sweetness. Yeah, and then it heightens the flavor of the mm. sweet and the sour. So, so good. I'm craving tortilla yeah. chips now. Of course, we totally. have some fabulous green guacamole potato oh, chips. So good with well, margarita. Potato. Yeah, with margarita. We will actually put a link to what they were because oh, they were delicious. Amazing. Yes. And we'll link to that. And when we put a picture on Instagram, which you guys should all follow us on, obviously, because we're amazing. Mm -hmm. um, while you're subscribing to us on YouTube and Spotify and iTunes, you should definitely be checking us out on Instagram at Creative Happy Hour. Podcast. So, podcast. Oh, yeah. Shit. Podcast. Yeah. Creative Happy Hour podcast. That and, would be us. <laughs> and Karina, our producer here, she puts these short videos that are rather amusing they if I are do say so, so myself. funny like sometimes I <laughs> like pee my pants because they're as opposed to what you were doing today with the bulletproof yes oil, um, that was different yeah that's a whole different <laughs> yeah, yeah we're not gonna talk, we're not gonna talk about that on this mm -hmm. episode but no we're yeah, not we'll talk about that shit later yeah so what we're saying is it's totally worth it to subscribe yeah. on every single platform that we're possibly on because yeah because we're creative on all we are platforms. across all platforms yes. that's the way we roll yeah. just in case we fuck up on one we can totally like make up for it on the other exactly that's how we exactly. roll. So yeah, that's so it. Check so, it out. Yeah, check it out. Exactly. So let's talk about the history yes. of the margarita. We talked about the flavors. Yes. Yeah, so the salty and the sour. There's quite a few people that tried to claim it. Oh, um, uh, they tried. They tried. Yeah. So you know, first appears. In, you tracked it down to like 1930 yeah. something. 1930. It first appears mm -hmm. in a cocktail book. Um. Called, let's see, I did my research. You did here, your research, but I can't seem to find it. Oh, yeah, My New Cocktail Book by G.F. Steele. I love the name, and, My New Cocktail Book. And they don't actually give any uh, inventor or person any credit well, for Well, he didn't bother to look for a real title for his book, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, that he didn't give the title kind of sucks. To go with it. Yeah, that, those are the days when you could just be like, I'm going to call it My, my New cocktail, cocktail Book. We should have called it this, like, Our New Podcast. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, if your podcast is called that we Let's did know. not we need to know yeah we need to talk to you <laughs> just so we can smell. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so but in this book it was called the tequila daisy oh well that's a daisy margarita daisy you know for the multi Spanish for daisy crew the the polyglots among mm -hmm. us yes um, yes that's very cool mm -hmm. and it was called the daisy god knows what I love. so there was this woman my favorite story about the margarita because everybody's like then this guy in tijuana was like oh i invented it he even had them put it on his gravestone that he invented the what? margarita yeah are you joking no like... i'm not this guy's name was um oh it was that it guy was Car oh, carlos was... herrera yeah, yeah carlos, carlos Good old Carlos, who pretended it was for this oh, picky dancer. His... Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. He said he made it for this picky dancer named Margarita or something like yeah. that. Who said that she was allergic to all alcohol except tequila. Oh, yeah. That how would you figure that way. one out? I yeah. don't really know. But she didn't like to drink it straight. I'm like, bitch, how many problems do you have? You know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but he made her this drink. 
I, I don't have any problem drinking it. Anyway, straight. but he said that was like in 1938, so he's a liar. He did not invent it, so I'm he sorry. He did not invent it because so, it first yeah. showed up in my new cocktail book in 1930. Exactly. So, so he was sorry, he was eight years Carlos late Herrera, for that. Like, yeah, too late, too little, Let's too late. Let's see what else. Well, um, my favorite was um, this woman, uh, Margarita Sames, who was a oh, socialite yeah. from Texas. Oh yeah, and didn't she, she go on a trip to Acapulco or something? She's like. I'm in Acapulco, and I invented this cocktail for my girlfriends. I'm sure she was just drinking at the bar, and she thinks she invented something, but that's cool. But Well, no one had the internet to check her. She was friends with one of the Hiltons, and he yeah. put it in his bar at the Hilton. And so then she was all like, I invented this, but we know she didn't. But it's cute, you know, it's cute anyway. I mean, whatever, we can go with that. But, I mean, even Jose Cuervo had ads in kind of the mid 1930s, no, 1945. Well, they were the first importers of, of tequila. So yeah. they had every reason to be to pushing. To promote the, yeah. the, the you go. margarita or the well, yeah, cause tequila I mean, daisy. Exactly. I mean, because <laughs> the tequila <laughs> will kill you if you don't mix it with something. Yeah. So I think Jose Cuervo, very smart to be coming up with nice little mixers for it and yeah. i mean and i think jose cuervo has the biggest like sales of mixer i believe as well I mean, yeah it's like a double market they're like oh so we have this wonderful alcohol it's fantastic can't drink it's trade or well, it was kind of like what, then, what was that ocean spray cranberry and that, um, the the um oh my god the uh, cape cod the cape cod the cape cod yeah. literally invented so yeah. that you could actually drink cranberry juice yeah basically. so they could sell it to adults because <laughs> no. they were only giving it to children exactly so i love those stories where it's kind of like a side oh, let's a side a little recipe you on know, the box it's like the margarita mix is the side yeah. card to the yeah i love it the side card the side, hey, yeah don't forget to, to watch the side card it's a great video it's so it's good. really good it is so good if i figure out how to do it i'll even put a link like in this one but i haven't like i mean i kind of know yeah. how to do it but i'm too lazy you can get it's sidetracked I could get the side, side yes, car. Exactly. So, so so we said why is it so popular? The you don't like my drink? I, You're I not guzzling like I, I guzzling. Oh my god, I'm just trying to pace myself. I oh, love it so much. Smart. She's it's the smart one. The smart one here. I'm the drinker. Yeah. Uh I I would if I could, but I know that I can't. It, like I'm I want like I actually want like ten gallons of this. It's oh okay. so good. <laughs> I mean, I just didn't know, like, you know, sometimes I'm feeling very vacation ready right now. Okay. <laughs> I just like we even have color for mm -hmm. once because we're like, we're vacation. Mm -hmm. And uh yes, yeah, I'm wearing lime. In solidarity. You're, and I'm wearing sky blue. Yeah, I'm just for the beach. Like You're escaping. going to the beach. I wish. I wish. Yeah, to the beach but, with you. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of vacation because we're going to be talking about the whole salty thing. In yes. A and, you know, escape vacation and stepping away is a really good way to get a little less salty about a situation. Yes. So I thought we'd, you know, just do that to represent. I think it's kind of awesome. So, it is. It's a great topic. I, first, before we talk about salty, I wanted to talk about the margarita glass. Oh, yes. Let's talk about the margarita glass. You'll notice never that, can figure that out. I know. You'll notice that I got um, new glasses. They're not exactly margarita glasses. Well, they're the kind I like. They're for short people. They're for short people. They're deep, they're deep margarita glasses. Uh -huh. But I felt compelled because a margarita is just not the same in a glass that's not margarita it's true ish it's true and this also is kind of a creative story because it's a little bullshitty story goes la bar um they had ordered these champagne glasses and instead of getting the normal champagne glasses they got the weird ones that are shaped like a margarita glass basically you know like right and oh. apparently that shape of the champagne glass is supposed to be mary antoinette's left boob so what did they typically <laughs> as a cocktail what did they put in there well like, they didn't they put the champagne in there originally in those glasses oh okay the so they were they were kind of champagne glasses to, they were champagne to glasses okay. but the the los angeles bar ordered champagne glasses oh. they thought they were going to be getting flutes they oh. get the boob glass and they were like what the hell are we going to do with these and they decided to start selling margaritas in them because they margaritas yeah. were a big could seller. you imagine if you got my boob uh, margarita <laughs> glass? You'd get like you get like, trashed. <laughs> you would get like, trashed. Yeah, you'd be like, Whoa, that's a giant glass of margarita. But so anyway, they, keep so going. They thought, so this is all about business, boobs. right? <laughs> Always an opportunity to talk I know, about boobs. I know. But um, this was so that you could sell more drinks because you know the glasses were kind of shallow, so it looked like it was a full glass, but you know, but it was really the so same much. in ounces. Mm, yeah, there you go. So, but we have got. I mean, I think we have kind of a deep. And I think that's kind of what they do in some of those faux mm -hmm. Mexican restaurants where mm -hmm. they do like the, they, they blend it with ice and yeah. then put it in the oh giant God. glass and then you think. That was a racket. It, the whole blended with ice yeah. thing was to make basic like, bitches think they were drinking a lot and all happy. And, it's and like, they were hydrating. Mm -hmm. And they're hydrating. Thank God. Yeah. So they don't fall all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Whereas notice how we're the real drinkers. 
Yeah. Ours are I was not shy with tequila. <laughs> no I'm already like No rocks and no slush in this. So. No, this is all clear. Oh, yeah. Tell us about the recipe. So it's pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> you know how I am with bomb wine recipes. I was like, um, I, yeah. So we essentially put tequila, which I did about two, two ounces, ounces per person. person. <laughs> so four. Four ounces. For the double For hit. the two of us. Because yeah. you never drink alone. Never <laughs> drink alone. And don't be... Don't be stingy with your tequila. I mean, Don't come do on. Mm -mm. Like, mm -mm. this, you know, this is important. People. You have to be generous. You have to be a generous Gener person. Generosity you know? is Generosity key. Is when you're making a margarita, mm -hmm. don't be. Give and ye shall receive. That's right. You reap what you sow. All that stuff. You know, golden rule. <laughs> There's a lot of shit that you should follow. There's a lot of things that you, you know, can prompt you and all, to doing the yeah, right thing. Right? Absolutely. And you can add either in creativity or in bed at the end of any of those statements. That's and right. Anyway, <laughs> yay. <laughs> so, yes, because we have a growth mindset as yes, always. We do always a growth mindset yes. in so, bed or in creativity. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm not good at doing that yet, <laughs> honey. I don't want to do that yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been saying that for 10 years <laughs> and I need you 10 margaritas. <laughs> Make yeah. me another. We'll see. <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, so, so then we did two ounces. So yeah, yeah, two ounces two of the two. We did a splash of Quintal. Yeah. Quintal. We did Quintal. <laughs> and we were lazy a little Well, we did the lime juice. Yeah. The and limes were a little limes sad. Were a little sad. They, they were, were a little dry. They were kind of Not pathetic. like us. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. I was and like, then, okay, I'm getting a right? cramp. Do you have something that we can just throw in there? And yeah. she's like, oh, yeah. And I have a. Asking you shall receive yeah, is what happens. That's so how it works around here. That's when I whipped out the organic margarita mix. <laughs> Tommy's, I believe. We're not going to yeah. plug them because they don't sponsor us yet. Yeah. But, but, but going. organic margarita mix, which had the agave syrup. And we kind of want a little skinny girl on it because we had more lime juice. Yeah. And then the splash of Cointreau that we already mentioned and lots of salt and then on the rim. Salt on the rim. And we didn't cheap out on the salt because some people sell that shitty margarita salt. We didn't do that. Nay, nay. Mold and sea salt all the way. Yeah. So. There it's, you go. It's badass. That's the way we And roll. it's delicious. And it's so good. Oh my God, it's so and good. And then we, I tend to like them up, so we We, we made it up. In. I decided to just do like that. It. Shake it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You like that shake I was like, in. oh, that's a growth, growth <laughs> producing mindset. Very good. So that's very fast with you. <laughs> I started to drool out of the side of my face. Okay, drooling. Anyway, is that'll be good for one of your short films. I know, exactly. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I'm not editing it out, so it'll just be like, you know, main thing and the short film. Love Ooh. it. So anyway, we were talking the about... The short and the long. Yes. <laughs> so we were talking about the mold and sea salt. So now we're going to yeah. talk about the history of the concept of salty. Yes. And the term salty. Because you hear it like in, you know, urban dictionary type Ooh, social media. She's salty as fuck, you know, like yeah. that whole thing. And I think some people use it properly and some people don't really know, you know, what, and I, and I'm always into looking at the nuances of everything, obviously, because. Well, what, she's a not? word person. She's oh, into boy. words. Words, man. Uh, yeah, I'm into words. I love words and I love yeah. the etymology and the weird shit. So we get down, you know, and nerdy on that yeah. one. But, um, so you already knew that salty was a Navy term. Yeah, like a salty dog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it had something to do with, yeah, ornery sailors mm -hmm. that have spent a lot of time at sea. Totally. And they were the ones with, like, the, their boots were all they're salty all like, and shit. They're like, ah, they're all know, pissed because they they've been on like, boat. Mm -hmm. you know? They've been fighting and they have scurvy and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They've drank a lot. They've drank and drank. <laughs> they've drank. <laughs> they've drunk. <laughs> they've drunk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they've drunk a lot of Navy great gin at this point. Yes, a the lot Navy. Of if you want to hear about the Navy. A lot of Gimlets. Yes. Yeah. If, watch the Gimlet episode because that's all about I'm the Navy. I'm going to be plugging past episodes. <laughs> right. But yeah. I mean, we've already gone down Sailor Lane. We have gone down Sailor and Lane. Not personally. I no, mean, they wouldn't actually. get scurvy with this drink either. They would not. lots of they vitamin not. C in this Very one. healthy. Um, <laughs> Anti Antioxidants galore. Yeah, totally. So, so yeah. And then so, I guess there was some other. The you hunting know, dog one. Well, the salty, the salty dog. Covering your just, dog with salt. Yes. It keeps ticks away. So blood sucking bees don't want them. So they perfect. Don't. I like no. that. So they like their blood not salty. I, I guess maybe, blood is salty enough. Yeah. I don't know. Well, maybe Weird. being salty has a little bit of a self preservation aspect to it. You know what I mean? Like if you're frustrated already, like if you're yeah. pissed at the world, like I think that you're kind of protecting yourself from the extra hurt that mm -hmm. comes from putting yourself mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm getting very woo woo and very like you know. But I think yeah, that but that's you're in Northern California. True. 
in Marin County. Woo woo is part of it's part of our thing. We're I allowed mean, to do it. It's completely yeah. appropriate to be woo woo. I think it's very appropriate. Yeah. So the if we're gonna talk about the nuances of salty, so uh, you've got the kind of angry and agitated that right. woo woo, irritated, irritated. You know, feel like off. people are conspiring against yeah, you. Yeah. So that's where it starts to get yeah. interesting because it stems from a feeling of being less than. It comes from right. a feeling of feeling uncomfortable because you're maybe out of place somewhere right. and then seeing somebody who is succeeding more than you are and who also makes you feel embarrassed by maybe pointing it out right. or making you feel bad and that I think you is feel where undermined in some you feel undermined form. very much yeah and that takes you a little bit to that whole imposter syndrome yeah um idea you know especially as a creative you often feel that imposter syndrome where you're yeah. like what the hell do or I why am I doing this why am I doing this is anybody how dare gonna be I? into this yeah who yeah. do I think I yeah. am you know even if you're an entrepreneur you're like you know how dare I think that I'd succeed yeah. and somebody else won't you know and so I think when you're in that sensitive position, I right. think that any kind of criticism is going to really hurt a hell of a lot. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I mean, you're you're more vulnerable to it if you're already exactly. feeling that way and you're mm -hmm. questioning what you're doing. Totally. And then totally. someone questions you, you automatically feel like you're kicked down a few notches. Exactly. So we're going to talk about some personal instances. That's when you that, start drinking. That's when you start Watching drinking. Watching Happy Hour podcast. Well, yeah, so you're getting ahead of yourself because we're going to give always. some... We're, always. You're Because you're, you're just a forward-thinking person. I know. Person. I'm a forward-thinking person. Are. I'm a thought leader. You're a thought leader. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to tell you some personal stories about what yeah. happened. We're going to tell you... Get a, a box of tissues. Get a box. It's really, really sad. Yeah, do it. We're going to tell you our stories. We're going to tell you the stories of other artists and creatives who let criticism and you know, all of that stuff, get them down, who actually quit the yeah. art world. And then we're going to tell you guys kind of what the antidote to that is. Like, how right. do you make a margarita out of your saltiness? And how do you kind of, you know, take a step back and, yeah. you know, use this as a strength? So that's where our whole glass F, empty glass F bowl. We'll yeah. come, I think, kind Heading of at the... Heading through the bitter. Yeah. Through so the I think salty. that'll come at the end. We'll, we'll, have, mm -hmm. we'll end on a high note and we'll probably be flying high because of the margaritas. <laughs> so it works out well. Yes. <laughs> so do you want to tell me your sob story first? Oh, uh, dude, I'm tell me your salty high. story. Tell mm. me your... Your sad and salty hmm. story of, 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 oh, well, for, wait, 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 we, let's first say where we got the idea from the art trauma. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> the, what made me think of my particular mm -hmm. salty situation mm -hmm. was uh, the, from Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic. Yes, Big Magic. Oh, like shit, magic, magic, magic. Yeah, but then she did a podcast magic. after that kind of based on the book magic called Magic Lessons. Lessons. Yes. And... You know, I've read Liz Gilbert's books before, and I've always enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. um, however, Big Magic wasn't, I mean, I kind of felt, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Like, she was talking to me like I was having a conversation. So it wasn't like mm -hmm. this was news to me. Right, right, right. I, it's all, you yeah. know, and, and again, I think we should talk about the book on another podcast. Oh, but, yeah, we'll, we'll do a deep dive but on Magic it. But Magic Lessons was yeah. brilliant. And mm -hmm. the podcast that she did where it was actually, you know, the action part of the book where she the applied part of the book so she and i love that and i i think that's what well i think that's why i like physics well and, so much i hated yeah. algebra i hated mm -hmm. calculus but i liked physics because it was like applied math right yeah <laughs> so so magic lessons is like applied art so she does these magic lessons where she deals with somebody who has some kind of art trauma or art oh. injury where I they, love that art injury. It sounds where, very yeah, it's, so but they, I think it must it feels that real. Yeah, so something happened to them that mm. that is creates 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 some kind of art block for them. So whether they're a writer or a musician or something happens in their life, young or old, or in between, mm -hmm. where they are somehow blocked creatively. Well, let's plug my book right now. Yeah. Because, you know, my book about writer's block is yeah. a pain in the ass, but it's all in your head. It's all in your head. It has a lot to do with all of yeah, that it kind has of traumatic, ego, psychology. bruising, psychology shit. So, yeah, yeah, it's total psychology. Mm -hmm. And so they, so they go, you know, they have um, an artist basically give whatever their issue is uh -huh. and what's kind of stopping them from doing their creative activity. And then she will bring in some kind of expert. So if the person is a writer, she'll often bring a writer, writer. in that's that's well, gone through yeah. a similar thing to so, give so that's experience. the thing. Like, like, oh yeah, I went through that. So you know? that's the thing with saltiness. I think that you you get so much more hurt if somebody in your own realm yes. actually, you know, is the critic. If it's somebody who's random, if it's your niece who's like next door who's like, Oh, this is yucky. 
You're like, yeah. whatever, you don't know what you're talking you don't about. Know what you're but talking if about. you're, for example, that's why the salons in France hurt so much, for example, because it was artists being snippy with yes. each other. And that's the worst of the worst. Like, even a critic is easier to justify. It was their justify. colleagues that were criticizing. Exactly. That's them. the worst of the worst. Like, it's easier if it's some critic whose job it is to be an asshole. Right. If they sense, oh, you're like, okay, I mean, it's smarts, but it's not mm. just like career destroying, I think. Right. So, anyway, okay, so tell us your story. Yeah, so anyway, I was, you know, I was, when I was listening to it, I was thinking about, like, what is my art trauma, whatever, and so... You're like, I, I must have one. <laughs> well, I, you know, I I have struggled over the years, you mm-hmm. know, with, uh, with actually owning the fact that I am an artist, you know. Just, and a lot of us do, and that's where the imposter syndrome yeah, comes so from Yeah, so I was like, what so business do I have, you know, mm-hmm. and even though it was this constant urge to be an yeah. artist or be a creator... Yeah, I just in my didn't writing, know how in, to... in my writing group, I always talk about the difference between aspiring writer right. and then like a successful author. And same thing goes with an artist, with like a hobbyist and an actual artist. Or it, there seems to be this huge divide, and really all it is is mindset. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. just a short on that. And I thought of this the other day when you were talking about that writer, aspiring mm-hmm. writer versus mm-hmm. accomplished writer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, in uh, there's a dental school in San Francisco, and as soon as you become a dental student in this mm-hmm. school, mm-hmm. they call you doctor. I love they that. They start calling you that. doctor from the moment yeah, it you start the school because yeah. because then you start thinking from the yes. mindset oh of my God, it changes being a doctor. Everything. And then that becomes your approach, yes. right? So anyway, it's, you know, I think it's the same thing with anything. You kind of, your mind will go to the place that you direct it, right? Yes. So yes. anyway, I, so I started thinking about, well, what's my heart trauma? Where does it, you know? So when I was probably in fifth or sixth grade, I don't know. I lived in cornfields in Ohio in a little, a little town called like, uh, Owensville. Lived in and cornfields. no one knows where it is. I except... wish I could illustrate your story. I know. Yeah. I know. That would be so cute. <laughs> I like, know. Little cornfields. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And I was a pretty, like, you know, pimply, yucky kid. No, don't. I was. And so anyway, I lived with, you know, these hillbillies, basically. And in the middle of cornfields. And... And your dad shot guns. And he shot guns out the liquor. window and, yeah, and popped pills. And, I mean, it was... It was real. It was, yeah. It's, it's, it's whatever. Well, you know... It's material. It's for, material. For artistic it's, Yeah. So, I mean, if <laughs> I have, like, a crazy personality, it's not by accident. I, I don't think... I don't I've endured some crazy ass shit. Yeah, I think we're all on the same boat. But, <laughs> so there was this softer, more sensitive side to me. And mm-hmm. I was in art class and I had an art teacher that she was, you know, this really vibrant, you know, she wore lips, really bright lipstick and bright clothing. <gasps> yeah, and she had kind of like long hippie hair. And mm-hmm. I, I thought she was fantastic. Of I was course. like, oh my God, who is this woman? And, you know, I wasn't really good at drawing, but I was good at like color and paint. And I was very artistic and creative. Mm-hmm. And she recognized it in me. Mm-hmm. And she started talking to me about going to this art summer camp. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, of course I'm interested in mm-hmm. art. Summer. She goes, oh, I'll send a letter to your parents. Shades of Harry Potter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The chosen one, right? See, this is like a totally... Yeah. Unfortunately, like, I did not get this oh, beautiful no. little... This, you know, she's like I the avatar get, of the chosen one. I mean, this is yeah. so sad. I didn't get the owl. Um, no, Hedwig but the letter to, came. Hedwig yeah. did yeah. not bring me, you know, knock down my door. If you had an owl, maybe things would have been... Maybe your, daughter, your dad shot him. Yeah, he probably killed him. I mean, that's <laughs> the way it would go around my house. Like, if I had owl. something, it would get killed. <laughs> and so anyway... I, I didn't, you know, I never heard anything from my parents. I didn't hear anything from and the, the whole time. They were probably being critical of your, yeah, they're probably side. like, what a yeah. stupid thing to spend yeah. money on. Like mm-hmm. we don't have any money to begin with. And certainly and not you want sending this? it to like yeah. finger painting camp. Right. Yeah. So anyway, but I never were lessening it. Like they were lessening it, making you feel like your creative urges were less than. So right. I mean, well, the worst you, part is, you know. is that no one said anything to me, not the art teacher, not my parents, no mm-hmm. one. And so mm-hmm. in my mind, I thought, Oh, my art teacher probably decided changed her suck. mind. She decided that I'm actually not yeah. good enough. And, you know, and I did kind of know that we didn't have any money and that the likelihood probably wasn't that I couldn't go. But anyway. But see, but the, what you're raising right there when I'm listening to your story is just kind of interesting. Sorry, it's really cool. I know. But your art teacher, like, your art teacher was that person to you that you looked 
to, you know, because you were feeling this imposter syndrome of like, how dare I believe that I'm creative enough? Yeah. She I'm a didn't... hillbilly. I'm a white trash kid. Yeah. Like there's no and... art in my life. Right. But she didn't even have to criticize you. You kind of pinned it on her. I did. You know, I did. you decided that that's I projected she... it. Completely. I projected completely. it. And I think half the time when we're, we're perceiving that the artists around us or the people we look up to or the other creatives and we're perceiving that they're judging. I mean, they're, right. yes, of course, people judge us. Like I'm, I'm sure people, constantly judging. people look at this podcast and they're like, lose ours but we don't care it's yeah. fine we've kind of like we've we've taken our own medicine and we've taken we're our too own advice like we're too old for the shit but i think in your case like of course you totally well, i was a little girl yeah and, and i had this i had this creative aspect of myself mm -hmm. and i had this was the first time that it was acknowledged by an outsider and it right? was so important and, and it was like, so yeah. important so long story short I, you know, I grew up, I end up moving to California. I go to college at UC Santa Cruz, but by my own, but you know, this, I this put story myself. But still really weighed on you, like, this whole yeah, time. I mean, so, really, yeah. Yeah, so I never, it was unresolved. I never knew what happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get this call. I'm in Santa Cruz, you know, finishing my last quarter of school. And my stepmother, who was married to my dad at the time, they were the couple that decided whatever they decided. Right. It, obviously, I wasn't going to art camp. Mm -hmm. um, right before she found out that she was terminal terminally ill she said oh i have you know there's a bag of stuff like, by the way just so i don't go to hell let me well uh, i mean like, yeah i mean we worked all that stuff out and i mm -hmm. you know i don't want to have any like bad feelings towards her because mm -hmm. you know she did the best that she could yeah, i think yeah, yeah. At, you know by mm -hmm. me but mm -hmm. you know um i don't mean to piss off people on the other side no um <laughs> no, but no. you know she <laughs> said i have a bag of your like school things and you know things your report card things that i kept for you over the years in the cedar chest and when i pass you know make sure you get your stuff so i but only then i don't want you pissed <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so i go and get the bag mm -hmm. the little paper bag of stuff and i go through it and there's i a dead owl yeah there's <laughs> a dead owl carcass <laughs> with a bullet through its head no just kidding <laughs> like, I'm terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this letter from my art teacher inviting me to this art Fucking camp hell. for the summer. Mm -hmm. And my heart lunges mm -hmm. because for all these years, I thought my art teacher had changed her mind. Yeah, yeah. And simply, all they had to do was say, look, I know you want to go to this stupid art camp. But we can't afford it. We yeah. can't afford it. Yeah. So unless you want to sell your body down at the end of the road for the which money. Which you might have done. Which I, mean, I could have. I mean, come on. It's art camp. I would have done it. <laughs> but anyway, that's my art trauma. Liz Gilbert, if you want to, you know, yeah. call one of your experts. She's crying. She's it's not, like, uh, it's not like, just the margarita. Yeah, like you need to. I yeah. need help. No, but look um, how look how salty you remained over this. Yes. Story. like it's so painful. Yeah, it is so painful. I mean, my story unfortunately doesn't involve dead owls or shooting dead owls <laughs> or anything like that. But you know, I grew up in an environment where my parents were very against any form of yeah. creativity. They were super straight laced. You know, they got married in 1969. But do you think either one of them was ever even close to being a hippie? Never. They were the I only mean, ones that weren't. They were. They were the only ones that weren't. Yeah. I mean, it, it was crazy. It's like young Republicans unite. Um, oh wow. They just. I mean, it was just so nuts. They. So whenever I talked about art, I mean, they would be like, "Oh, you're." So stupid thing or your hobby that or yeah you, you know and in a way they did they did support it to a degree by buying me all the art products that, and you know supplies that I wanted I actually had a little art studio in my bedroom so they were kind of curious about no who this person no. was or do they just want to keep you busy and out of trouble <laughs> ding 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 and also they were like what do we buy this bitch that's gonna make her happy yeah so we don't just with go art. with the yeah just go with the art supplies better than you know whatever else i would, right. might have wanted so yeah i think that's what it was they're like yeah. let's keep her busy let's keep her occupied idle hands all that right. shit so <laughs> the work of the devil <laughs> yeah so um but i ended up having so i felt like i was always really late coming to the art game mm -hmm. they didn't let me go to art school so i had to get a phd instead you could have gotten a PhD in art. I could History have, but something. by that point, I hadn't been able to do an undergrad, uh, an undergrad right. in art. So I felt like, just really, I felt like I was late to the game. I felt like I didn't have any of the professional skills. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I had that imposter syndrome where I was like, yeah, I've been making art this whole time. And but you I never don't... went to art camp. No, I never, no, no, fucking no, 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 no art camp for me I at know. all. Like I didn't do any of that stuff. And even my art teacher in high school had told my parents, you know, she should go to uh, RISD 
and continue the art because she's, you know, really... She has talent. Yeah, she has talent. And my parents were like, no fucking way. So that... Yeah. Was, what are we going to tell our friends? We can't deal with that Exactly. Shit. So it, yeah. that was pretty much of a bummer. But I finally kind of got my shit together to where I was like, okay, you know, I was painting all the time and, you know, doing all this. And to this day, like, this is really sick. To this day, I've had multiple art shows. Yeah. And if people are like, oh my God, are you an artist and a painter? I'm like, no. I go, I paint, but I'm not a painter. And, and that's something where like, at least in the Which world, is like, like impossible. Right. It's impossible right. no, to I paint know, it, and not be a painter. How the fuck does that work? And I spend my days telling people that if they write, they're a writer. But do you think that I can apply that to yeah. my painting? No, this, I cannot. She needs I to cannot. be hacked. Yeah, no, I can't. Right. It's just kind of, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, like, it no longer matters as much to me because it's not what I'm focusing on. Right. And it's fine. And I've sold enough paintings at this point where I can be like, yes, I'm a painter. Fine. But yeah. in my heart of hearts, I'm like, no, I'm not. But I finally had an art show. That's what psychological anthropology is all about. Right? Right? <laughs> right? That's good. Yeah. Like, um, but so I finally have an art show, and there were two other artists in the show. Um, one other who was kind of uh, kind of new to the art game, me, yeah. who I felt like I had been painting for a really long time, mm. but, you know, whatever. And then another woman who was kind of what I considered to be this professional artist. And so I was really looking to her as this model of like, oh God, she's the real art success. Yeah. I was like, she's the real artist in the bunch. I mean, I was doing all the work like for, you know, all the setup and the invites and the, we got sponsors and stuff. And I was busy doing it. Cause I was like, well, I'm not the real artist. Like she is. And she kind of acted a little bit like a bitch to me. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, oh my God, I was really just thinking like, oh, it's cause I suck. Cause I'm not a real artist. Like, oh, it's super, so just right? super, super lame. But just since I had such imposter syndrome, like mm -hmm. any little thing, and maybe she wasn't even being that, hugely bitchy maybe she felt insecure yeah you know what i mean like she was much older than i was like maybe she was like hey i'm you know this younger bitch is yeah coming in. yeah doesn't but, even didn't even go to RISD. right exactly she did. didn't go to RISD. so yeah but at the time like i couldn't even see that clearly for right. what it was and then of course you know after the art show i'm so busy reading the visitor book because i'm just like so oh, intent on this any is kind of trauma feedback. i got trauma in here oh yeah, yeah like so you know like i need the feedback and i'm gonna sit there and somebody who I didn't know had written, oh, this is a very amateur show. And I was like, oh, oh my God, oh, that's so terrible. And I felt so horrible. And then even the fact that they'd spelled amateur wrong, like wasn't enough. I mean, oh. I swear they spelled amateur wrong. And I was like, and so I, of course, you wrote correct under, I corrected it. She corrected I'm, it the grammar, she's grammar. I'm, I'm grammar Nazi. Grammar oriented. Uh, yeah, a little grammar oriented. But um, I was like, I corrected. I still felt horrible. Even this person who couldn't spell amateur, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, they probably, right? like, like, they probably never painted anything in their life. Nothing. But, you know, I'm thinking, oh, but then I read a little bit further and I came upon um, a note by my piano teacher mm. who I hadn't seen since I quit piano when I was about 10 years old because I hated it so much. My parents, yeah. they didn't want art, but piano was like, you it know, was part of the, it was part of the European. thing that you're supposed to do. And actually, what's funny is my piano teacher had actual Monet paintings that her family collected art. Oh, wow. She had an actual Monet. And I would sit and play piano for hours, crying. Because you hated look it. Because I hated it. Crying and looking at the Monet. And so that's a childhood trauma memory, and I hated it. And I, w I tried to quit so many times, and, you know, i just get punished, punished, punished. And finally, I quit, like, you know, once yeah, and for all. Yeah, finally gave up. Because it was like, it wasn't okay. And my piano teacher had come to the show. I hadn't mm -hmm. seen her there. And she had written in the book, she goes, I always knew you would do something creative and succeed in the arts. I had a feeling it might not be in piano. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, like that was such a thing. It was that, the like, antithesis of what this other, completely, completely. This other experience yeah. was. So that's the thing where I think like one of our little lessons for getting over the saltiness and the, is really trying to focus on the positive. Well, I mean, and it sounds to find stupid, those but people, it, yes. the community of people. And I think that's mm -hmm. what creative happy hour is about is mm -hmm. finding those people that that you know maybe they don't love your art maybe they don't yeah. it doesn't speak to them in any way mm -hmm. but but they honor this part of you that is creative and and this part of you that is an artist totally and and that's I mean that goes a long way when you know, there are so many people, there's so many naysayers. Oh my God, in so this many. world. Of... And also you have to look, I mean, that's, it's, I think we can just launch, I mean, we had a whole list of, you know, artists 
who quit because of the critics. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so many of them. It's kind of fast. I mean, Marcel Duchamp, who we talk about yeah. all the time, because, you know, anybody who makes a piece of art out of a urinal is my is kind of artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he literally quit art because of the critics yeah. and because of the negativity that he felt. And that was a common refrain. I mean, I had a list of a ton of artists, and yeah. I don't even have to name, a, you know, all I of mean, them. I mean, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this can think of an artist. You can. The funny thing is, is like, think of it, of it this way, though. Like, other than Duchamp, most of the names that I would bring up are not famous names because they quit. And, you know, so if you want to succeed, like, quitting's not going to get you ahead. I no, mean, so what quitting is it that's not you... really an option, I think. No, I mean, I think no. if you're compelled to create and do art, exactly, you mm -hmm. cannot quit. And it doesn't matter, no. in my opinion, and you know, whether you become a famous artist or not. Absolutely not. I mean, like, we were talking about Matt Go the mm -hmm. other night, and, mm -hmm. I mean, that guy died. He died before he even sold a painting. Impoverished. He never... He never and sold he a is, painting. Yeah, he never sold a painting. Ever. He's one of the most famous. Yes. And yes. in time, you know, like he he's timeless mm -hmm. as far as, mm -hmm. you know, young people, you know, I think we were saying, you know, he's kind of, he's just part of the culture. He's part of the he culture. Is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this guy couldn't catch a break. His he whole couldn't catch career. a break. And, you know, he, he died been, poor without absolutely. selling a painting. I and mean, then again, did he ever quit? No, he didn't. No, he just now, kept I know that that trucking. is, yeah, that is not cheerful. Because no, it's not no cheerful. one wants to know that they're famous okay. after they're well, dead. I know. Do you want to hear something kind of more cheerful? There's this guy. Yeah. Who, that was my I, glass half empty, by the way. Right? Oh, my God. Well, kind of more cheerful. Not really, but kind of dark humor. Um, I was reading about this critic, and I won't mention his name, but basically he was a critic for a long time. And he was mm -hmm. an asshole. I mean, he would always, like, criticize. Like, crit it's so easy to criticize. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in when mm -hmm. I do critiques of people's work in, in writing or in painting, I want to make sure that people know there's a difference between criticizing and critiquing. Oh, I mean, yeah. You can't be a negative shit. It doesn't do service. If you are a critic because you say you love art, <clears throat> don't wreck artists by being an yeah. asshole. Like the artist psyche is very, you know, is, is sensitive. And you, you know, if you're doing well, and that, that's why it's able to create. Is exactly. Because it is it's that extra sensitivity sensory. and it's exactly it's yeah. So if you're trying to break that down, yeah. You're an asshole. You're not actually a good critic. You're just right. being a jerk. So if you can critique to, you know, improve or if you can give your opinion or you can say why it inspired you, mm. that's a great thing. But honestly, this is something where I think that if you have nothing good to say, shut up. Maybe you should shut the fuck up. Shut the but hell. so this critic, he was he was that kind of critic and he was kind of and then he turned to artistic production himself. Oh. And very quickly, poor little critic couldn't cut it. Uh, he said everybody uh, was mean. He said it was a toxic rat. environment. I was like, Oh, was it? I'm so sorry. Oh, to poor hear that. baby. Yeah, poor baby. So, you know, Ooh, again, golden she's rule. She's mad at this person. I think, no, I, I think that so many people's careers. She's going to rub salt in his mm. eyes. I think so many people's <laughs> careers have been completely destroyed by people who were, people who are probably salty at their, at their talent. Yeah. People who were jealous. People who are critical they're critical because of insecurity and i think you yeah. really need to open your eyes to that and realize well, that well you have to be strong enough to absolutely. recognize it mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and two walk away from it you yes. know so that's the and, other thing with the margarita yes yeah, just a liquid escape walk away walk away i mean some people can't walk away i mean i know i was telling you about Chandra Ram, one of my favorite oh, books written by oh. gregory david davis mm -hmm. gregory davis yeah and yeah david gregory david okay that up, Gregory. Sorry, sorry, Gregory. So, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I his book was probably one, you told of, me is one, one of, of my ever books, read. yeah, one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is, I mean, it's based on a true story. He escapes mm -hmm. prison in Australia, he goes into the underground in Bombay in India, wow. and he's this, he's ultimately this really great ethical guy mm -hmm. who's living in this, in the dark dark underground world of the black market. Wow. Wow. Not only do you learn a lot about the black market and mm -hmm. how it's necessary to have a black market to have the white market. Yeah, but it's that whole duality. It's yeah, like, it's it like is. dark matter and it's, you know, it, you, it's you interesting. Need, you need those things. You yeah. realize like how, the importance of it, but mm -hmm. you know, he does all these wonderful things in the book, mm -hmm. but he does have to end up serving his time in order to clear his name and become free. 
And that happens whether it's legally or just for your psyche. You have to. You have to serve your time. Metaphorically, you have to serve your time. And you have literally to serve your time. And you have to pay your dues. So that yes. whole imposter syndrome. So that's the other thing I was going to say. It's like, part of the process. It's like yeah. the grieving process. It is. It's like, it's like there's like shock and then anger and yes. then sadness. Yes, and then, and then resignation and, and, and then yeah. All that. yeah. And it's the same, I think, when you are negotiating some kind of identity mm -hmm. or, you, or, you know, where you're psychologically attached to this identity as the artist. Right. I think and you, that's, well, I think that's what said, we wanted to say. That was the other very glass half full moment yes. that we wanted to talk about, which was that if you're being so hurt by this criticism or if yeah. you're being so salty because you see somebody else who succeeded where you failed, or if you see another artist who you think that they're, or another creative or another entrepreneur, and you look at them and you're like, wow, I wish that was me. But you think that their success is not deserved and you're getting or you salty feel about it. That's an opportunity for you to see that yeah. it matters to you, that this is maybe something that you would want, but you have to put in the steps. But you, but, or you're physically being barred from, you know, like mm -hmm. in this book, mm -hmm. what I was going to say is that he, you know, he did have to serve his time and the mm -hmm. guard, the prison guards kept destroying his manuscript. Yes, so he would incredible. write his manuscript and then he would rewrite it. And because wow. he had to rewrite it constantly, mm -hmm. it was one of the most well-written pieces of literature I've ever read because, right. and, and I would argue it's because he had to keep write, rewriting well, it. it. Was the struggle and the rewriting I yes. think it's both things because I think it's when you're barred from doing something that obstacle makes you so much stronger yeah the like, obstacle is the way it's, you're it's, gonna say that it's, oh my it's, god it's, no but I mean it's like I'm always flagging Ryan Holiday because you know it he you know Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics mm -hmm. you know he talks about how using you know you can look at it as an obstacle mm -hmm. and be like, oh, well, fuck that. I can't do, I can't do that. I'm Forget just giving it. up. Yeah, let's just give up Or right you can use no. it as an opportunity to oh, hone absolutely. your craft and be better at well, what you're doing. And to see doing. what matters to you and to see, Go okay, so. the obstacle. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you're like, okay, now I see this. Now I realize this yeah. is what I want. And you're like, and I'm being kept from this. And I'm being, and yeah. this person has said this bad thing about my performance in this, in some degree. Yeah. Is there some level of truth to it? What are the steps that I can take to go right. from here to there? having imposter syndrome is some of it's not useful, but some of it is where you see the things that are missing. Yeah. And that you see that like, Hey, okay. I feel like an imposter because I know deep down inside that I'm a beginner at this. Right. Everybody starts somewhere. I think it's an opportunity to yes. see, you know, what's important. What am I missing? What yes. are the steps I can take? And, you know, acknowledge the saltiness, right? We'll lick the salt off the rim and, and use on. it to cut through the bitterness and, heighten the sweet and the sour. Oh my god, Micah, that was beautiful. Oh, I love that. Cheers. Cheers to that. You're so sweet. Yes. Love it. Happy, happy, you guys. Cheers, cheers. Remember to subscribe. Remember we need to you. We need you so badly. We need you. And you need us. You need Whatever. us so bad, need too. Us. Come on now. We're here Come for on. a reason. Yeah. Uh, no, and then comment mm -hmm. down below if you guys have any stories of art trauma. Yes, art trauma. And ways that you dealt with the salty, went through the sourness, mm -hmm. and encountered success. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. See you next time. Bye.